Uh, so folks, a uh, uh, very good afternoon to all of you. Uh, I think you've, you've seen quite a lot of data uh, that was presented since morning. Uh, I think what has been truly intriguing is, is how a lot of that information is converging to hybrid. It's an irony for me standing here to talk about in-office culture, not because I don't like it, it's purely because uh, even when I started my career more than two decades back, I started remote. And uh, I used to work in Singapore, uh, supporting uh, you know, all of Informix's customers across Asia Pacific. Uh, I didn't know how to speak Japanese, I didn't know how to speak Chinese, I didn't know how to speak Korean, uh, but we still had to support uh, the Informix engine and the tools uh, that were written in the local language, supporting all of those customers with a live uh, you know, uh, chatbot, which was a real person on the call every time we were on with a customer. And that's exactly how we would, we would add features or, or troubleshoot for the customer, right? And all of the setting out of Singapore, supporting all of those other countries across uh, uh, Asia and Southeast Asia. So for me to be standing here and talking about in-office is an irony, but um, I think that's the reality of how the world keeps shifting. So. With that, uh, you know, one of the, the items I had to do, so I had to follow, you know, Gleb and Anne and others uh, to show you some data uh, to prove, you know, what I mean. So if you really look at this chart, while it shows only 2019, and, and this was a ISD workplace study that was done, uh, while it shows only 2019, the reality is not too far uh, when you look uh, at the past as well. I think one of the most important items in this is Forget about the pandemic. If you really look at the workforce, there were people either by function or by role or by, uh, by departments that were working remote or they were hybrid in the way they were uh, performing their job and performing it effectively, uh, right? And, and many of us have been part of that at different points in time in our, in our careers, whether it was for an elongated period of time or whether it was for a particular role that we played at that point in time. And if you go by that statistic, you know, obviously we are at about, uh, you know, a higher percentage when you look at what happened during the pandemic and that was forced on us. Uh, but at the same time, you do start seeing the change that is coming back this year, uh, more than the last two years. And not that any of us is foreseeing, a, you know, a resurgence of the pandemic, but uh, the fact of the matter is, uh, you know, it is trending back down or it is trending back to an office. Uh, or it is trending back to what I would say is a, is a mixed bag or, or a hybrid, right? So I won't drain the slide in terms of the, the percentages by, by each one of them, but uh, I want to give you a different perspective, right? Now, that was a regional perspective. Uh, this is more of a perspective by industry sectors and uh, by that segment, what does it really mean uh, for an in-office working culture uh, from a percentage perspective, right? And, and against that, what the, uh, the the remote culture really meant, uh, purely by percentage numbers. Again, these don't mean a whole lot if you don't dig into the details to see what does that really mean. And, and the reason why I say that is because I think even during the peak of pandemic, uh, one of the things that, that Costco did was that uh, their CEO was very clear at the time saying, if every one of my employees at the warehouse is going to be working physically, and they are serving customers, there's no reason for the others to feel unsafe to be able to work in the office, right? So they actually asked everyone to start coming in, uh, except the consultants or people who were traveling in from other locations to come into work. So it, it's, a, it's a notion of how, you know, each organization uh, looks at the problem and how they are bifurcating it between employees versus, you know, are they able to create a safe environment for people to work? And I think that was the call that Costco took. Uh, look at it with, with, a, with a, you know, a, a, a pharma and a med device firm like uh, AbbVie in Chicago. They did something similar. They said if everybody in the, in the R&D in my manufacturing plants are gonna be in person and they have to work that way because otherwise we're not gonna be able to do what we have to do even during COVID as a company. There's no reason for the rest of you to be working remote. We do wanna create a safe environment. So they actually started putting in place a, you know, a hybrid model for people to come in safely, work safely, 
and have you know distances between their workspaces so that they could continue to be productive within the work environment itself of course there were exceptions there were exceptions for people who had you know health issues because of which you know they could have been at risk being in person uh, there were exceptions for you know people who did not have the ability to get in without uh, you know additional help uh, to be able to get into an office environment but those were the adjustments or those were the the allowances given to the uh, the employee or the the workforce to adapt to what was really needed from a firm perspective so to me uh, the the question was not about looking at percentages but the question was looking about sorry uh, looking at what did it really mean for in office versus remote given the context of the organization the roles that people were playing and hence uh, you know the approach that was being taken the the third angle that i probably wanted to call out here is that uh this is about employee behaviors and and how that has changed uh both during covid and especially during the peak of it if you may right so the statistic i purposely picked between 2020 and 2021 because that's when you saw the the maximum impact of uh all of us pretty much working in a remote fashion and if you really look at the the chart the 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 reason why i wanted to highlight this was not for anything else but the fact that wherever we saw the managers the teams working in a in a more collaborative close knit format irrespective of where they were working from i think the 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 throughput the productivity and their ability to you know understand each other and and work together was a lot better than people who just chose to you know uh, do their own thing in an isolated fashion not really connecting with the employee or empathizing with with them or most importantly uh, you know not having the trust in that in that workforce to be able to deliver to what they really wanted right and i think those those parameters translated to uh, you know employees considering whether they really wanted to stay with the firm or move on and in other cases uh, you know it was also about transitioning into a, a different role and you saw a lot of that during the pandemic where for example we had you know people who were working in restaurants people who were working in other places did not have a role to play they moved on they trained themselves they moved on to other roles and they got more comfortable they actually learned during the process some of them uh, actually ended up with much higher paying jobs than they were doing previously so there is an evolution in that path as well it's just a matter of you know how people have taken that and and have organizations been able to support that kind of a shift in people's want or employees wanting to do a particular thing and how well are you supporting that transition for them right uh, i think that was the the other criteria so with that uh, you know we as we did this exercise one of the things that we also ended up doing was looking at categorizing this under four different buckets if you may right so the bucket number 1 is what i was uh, calling out earlier to say how are the employee interactions uh, with the manager with the other team members is this within a close knit network or is this expanding into other teams what does that impact personally you know when we ran this across several organizations one of the key elements that i saw that it impacted was how are we innovating by learning and understanding from other teams and how is that being brought back into the job that we are doing or how is that contributing to the organization itself overall so i think that was a critical element i saw innovation in one of the earlier uh, you know uh, sessions as well so that was a key outcome of how we uh, looked at that that employee uh, uh, behavior and expectation the second one uh, there is there will always be this debate of uh, what is the productivity of the employee and the team uh, but the reverse question from an employee is are you giving me autonomy enough to be able to do my job and be able to you know productively get my job done so look at the outcome look, look at the results don't just measure me for the hours of work that i'm putting in because if that's what you were measuring me for then you did not need me as an intellectual to work work for you right and i think that's a fundamental question that we all have to realize but at the same time uh, you know respect to be able to both measure it as well as uh, you know uh, do the right thing for the employee in that sense so i think that's the second point that i wanted to call out the third one is actually an important element because this is not just about the transition that i was referring to for people who are going to look at how am i going to change from uh, you know a, a career path to another or how do i evolve in my role as i take on other things within the organization this has two implications one is if you're not an office 
if you're not connected to a, another leader who might be responsible for a different function, a different uh, role within the organization, how do you expect to make that role transition within the organization? It's not going to fall into your lap by, by itself, is, is one way of how we, how we look at an in-office culture. The second aspect of that is how do you facilitate new ways of working for them, right? And that new ways of working could mean today we are building a product and that product needs uh, people with a particular skill set, capability and mindset to be able to come together and work on it. And, the, and most of the time the product development work is in a, in a short span of time. And hence it requires people to be able to adapt to that ways of working of that team. And that comes about in an in-office culture. It cannot necessarily come just because you're working on a, on a Zoom call or on a Teams call or a WebEx uh, in that sense. This also brings to fact that when new products are introduced in the, mar in the market, product firms are actually sitting together to do that, that whole planning, allocation, the inventory, and the marketing campaigns that are associated with it. So when we worked uh, with, with somebody like Levi's from the Bay Area, one of the things that we realized was that sitting remotely, their sales teams were, were under promising on what they would deliver. Their marketing teams had a different approach to what they wanted to really get through during the pandemic. The manufacturing teams were confused in terms of you know how much to uh, to actually you know get through in their production cycle and hence the third party contracts that they were signing across the globe with their with their manufacturers and last but not the least finance had a problem because they didn't know how much to allocate as a budget for all of these things so in in our mind the way we drove this for them was to say there is there is data behind all of this historically across other products that you've done we actually used our, our AI engine to be able to help them uh, predict some of the, the inventory, the planning, the, the, the associated aspects of it. So I'm coming back to some technology and tooling that is helping it out. But at the same time, it was more about how am I now going to be able to get these teams to work together in small groups so that they understand and appreciate each other's point of view and positioning and the actions that they need to take that needed us to bring these teams together. They, it needed us to bring them together to see each other eye to eye and, and understand the perspective of the other individual because if you're not doing that, you're just getting on a Zoom call and 30 minutes later you're logging off onto your next assignment or your next task on the calendar, right? It didn't really have that empathy towards the role that the other teams were playing and hence the disconnect in the organization itself. So something like this that we were able to drive for them during the pandemic and right through the pandemic, help them improve what I would say is approximately about 95% plus, sorry, 90% plus on the revenue shaping or the revenue prediction for them. Obviously using a lot of the AI te technologies that they were able to do on the data itself. But last but not the least on that particular example, what they were also able to do was effectively reduce the dilutions that they were doing on the products that were not selling in the market. So they had to do that because they were they were not selling enough and there was more manufacturing that was happening. So inventory and inventory holding costs were higher for them. So they were ending up doing product dilutions, which are obviously impacting their margins as well. So this is a two-way street. It's not just about looking at the employee experience alone, but it is also about how do we you know improve the organizational performance uh, based on you know elements like this. So with that, uh, you know it, it brings me to the next point where you know uh, I, I want to call this as the workplace experience is a priority and, the, and, and it is a priority at the topmost level. So when we, when we looked at this, we looked at this with, with CEOs who are actually chartering their CHROs to say, let's please build a superlative experience for our employees to be able to have a safe and a productive work environment. And what do I need to be able to do to be able to make this happen in the most effective way? Which means, in my mind, I would say the in-office culture needed an absolute reset, right? A hundred percent reset. And I'm saying hundred percent not because you know people don't come back to work and they're not working in the same way that they were doing it before, but it is for the managers, the the management team, as well as the the team leaders and the workers to so understand that. This does need each one of us to adapt in the work environment different from the way we were doing, way we were doing it before. Now what that meant was that we looked at you know, examples in, in a slightly different way. We said let's split this by a combination of functions and industry sectors and roles that people are playing. So we looked at you know, HR and finance as a function. We looked at IT as a function or a department. We looked at 
uh, you know, employees who are working in the healthcare space or in the telco space as a as a uh, industry. We also looked at a combination of saying, you know, what was required in the retail industry because uh, the retail industry was probably the one that completely continued to work right through the pandemic, right? And if they were not there, I don't know what we would have done for you know our daily needs from a grocery perspective and everything else. The same is true for the, the healthcare industry as well. If they were not there, we would have suffered a lot more during the pandemic than we already did. So with that in mind, we had to come up with processes, tools, and other artifacts that was needed for us to you know look at what, what defines the employee experience of the future uh, in the office. And, and the office meant different things for each one of these, uh, these personas in that sense, right? And that's where the reset started, if you may. We went further. Uh, we actually took the, the, the logic to say, uh, you know, let's run this across the globe, uh, across many of our clients. And uh, we did this specifically for people who are 100% remote, to say in the remote model that you've been working, what have some of the challenges been and, and what are you having to do about it? So we, we captured some of these data. I'm not you know, going to throw about 1,000 line items there. Pick the top four that I thought was relevant. Uh, one of them was, uh, you know, I'm not able to do my job well because I'm on phone. I'm a remote worker. I'm on phone. And despite being on phone, I, I'm not able to resolve what I needed. So eventually I had to get to a, a local IT. And that local IT meant I had to get to one of the office setups that was available. The second was, and, and, and Wipro is, is, has been through this. We've, we've had about uh, 45 to 48% of, of our 260,000 people who are new to the firm in the last two years, which means they were not employed with Wipro before the pandemic. Now, this is partly because of attrition. This is also because of the growth that we've had, but that's a huge number. We've never seen that number at that, at that level uh, in the last decade or plus. In that context, this became a huge issue. We, we, in fact, while, while this is a quote here, uh, we actually had one of our employees in a survey who wrote out saying, do you know who is, your, who is your reporting manager or your boss? And the person's answer was, oh, I just log into my laptop uh, for a call and I work on my, on my machine for what I have to do. I really don't know who my reporting manager is. That drove the, the objective for us to say, uh, you know, how do we help improve that, that interaction and the ability for the employee to understand the reporting manager, build a relationship there and enable them to, you know, work for each other and empathize with each other, build that trust level, if you may, right? Uh, the third one was, was even more interesting. We have all of these, you know, IT teams that are providing support, whether it is for laptop or otherwise. Employees are working remotely. Unfortunately, the whole model was set up in such a way pre-pandemic that uh, there was really not as much of a focus on how do I enable that same service that I, that I provide within an office environment to an employee who's working remote. To accentuate that problem, most employees moved locations. They were not staying in the same location that they had declared earlier. Now they're working in different locations where the company did not even have the ability to be able to physically help them when they needed some uh, you know, in-person or smart hands help, if you may, and people had not declared where they are. Now, now this becomes an even bigger issue, and that's where, uh, you know, in, in some cases we found people had to drive at least about 100 miles for them to get to the nearest site. Did not help productivity for the organization, neither did it help the, the employee from an experience standpoint, right? And the last one, I think, is, is also about uh, the team collaboration, and this is also critical, and we experienced this uh, across many of our customers where they said, I don't really know who my team members are beyond, you know, seeing them on a call, being with them as part of, you know, how I'm working together on a project, whether it's a marketing project, it's a sales project, or it's a, it's a technology project that I'm working with them on. I don't really understand the, the psyche behind the individual, what drives them and, and how do I make sure that we can collaborate together to make it happen even better. So that became a, another feedback that we captured. Now, the reason why I'm covering all of that is because as much as we could build digital tech processes that could really help employees for working in a remote environment, uh, they're still, you know, in some form or manner frustrating for the individual because it just doesn't enable them to do what they need to do in every case. And the, the experience is disjointed in that sense. The second one, is it is clearly a lack of interpersonal skills. End of the day, we are all human beings. 
if we could have worked remotely, I could have been on the moon and working for the, the next 20 years, but that's not happening, right? So we are all uh, interpersonal uh, dependent, and in that sense, you know, it is only when you get together that you're able to do this. Last but not the least, the provocative thought is, if individuals can go on vacations, they can be at dinner, they can be at holiday events, etc. from a personal standpoint, they could easily very well be in an office environment as well, collaborate and, and learn what that means for them if they've forgotten it over the last two years. And hence, how do we bring this together, if you may, right? I, I, and, I'm, and I'm purposely bringing some of these points on because uh, there has been a lot of debate, there continues to be debate at our customer sites, including Wipro itself, on where and how this, uh, this needs to evolve. So what we did here was, we actually said, let's reimagine what the, uh, the experience journeys would look like uh, for employees. Again, this was this is a this is a ServiceNow uh, source slide in terms of how they have evolved their platform or the product to be able to uh, you know look at various different aspects of a hire to retire uh, journey for an employee within any organization. We actually took that as a learning uh, as a as a very uh, strong partner of ServiceNow. We actually built what we call as a honeycomb, right? And the reason why I call that as a honeycomb is because. The journey doesn't end with what we identify. It's just the starting point. And the starting point for any of our clients, including Wipro, could be any one of these, uh, these honeycomb cells, right? So it's just a matter of where do I start from and how do I expand from there to be able to enable my employees and my workers to be able to get their job done, enable them to make sure that they are productive within the organization most importantly, how do I set this up in such a way that it is simple and easy for them to adapt and adopt, if you may. And it doesn't matter whether it is in office or, or remote or hybrid. It's a matter of how this needs to work in that integrated environment, if you may, because it's going to be a mix of any one of these. One week, I'm going to be absolutely remote. The next week, I could be 100% in office. The third week, I could be you know, partially remote, partially uh, in office. And I was just discussing this with somebody else. The other day, we had a partner in our office. We were actually doing a in-person session. We then had about four or five people who joined us on a call. And we are in a conference room with a WebEx screen, with the cameras on. But the minute the, the person walked up to the whiteboard, everybody on the, on, the, on the remote connection was disconnected because they really didn't know what was going on in the room, right? Because they couldn't see what the person was writing. Uh, despite the best of camera capabilities that we had, it was a disjointed experience. So how do you really improve some of those is, is part and parcel of the honeycomb approach that we're that we're taking with our clients. Now, it, it all has to come to reality. So I'm just going to give you two or three examples of what we're doing. I'll start with, uh, you know, what we're doing for ourselves as Wipro. Uh, we launched two different things. Uh, this was envisioned before COVID. It just got, uh, you know, accelerated during COVID. We actually ran a process or an initiative called Quantum. This was to improve the employee experience across the board and improve productivity for us as an organization. We actually looked at this across the board to say, how do I look at finance and controllership? How do I look at procurement, sales, pre-sales, delivery and operations, employee and HR? Of course, we are an IT company, so these were the, the, the predominant uh, you know, functions for us from a, uh, you know, how do we do work with our clients' perspective. But the fulcrum of where we paid our attention was these four things on the, on the left, which is, how do I improve the simplicity of, of the experience that I'm giving our employees? How do I ensure that it improves the velocity at which the work gets done for them? And how do I improve the velocity at which they're able to deliver to uh, the, the work product that they're trying to get their customers out? How do I improve visibility or transparency of the data that we already have within the organization? And last but not the least, empowerment. And the reason why I say empowerment is because the minute you have the data and the insights with you as an employee, as a manager, as a team lead, your ability to be able to use that effectively for your job increases 100% and more. And that's the vision that we had as part of, you know, the four fulcrums of the vision that we worked on. Uh, the rest of it is in terms of, you know, how did this come through over the last two years, what we're continuing to evolve as we learn uh, the hybrid model and, and the implications of that for all of us. But clearly as an organization, we've instituted uh, a uh, you know a work back at office starting this year. Uh, we started it with all of the senior employees because we had to get change the mindset there first. And then as we go through the process, we are making every one of the employees come back. And when I heard the difference in the millennial versus the Gen Z, as you called out earlier, 
what I have to say is that the Gen Z's were the first to come back. When you head back into any of the Wipro offices globally, you will actually see that irrespective of whether any of the other workforce is on or not, the Gen Z's are the one who are there. They are eager to learn, they are eager to adapt, they are eager to uh, you know, uh, be a part of uh, initiatives or programs within the organization as well. I think that is kindling the rest of the organization to say, if they can be there and they are there to learn and adapt for the organization, why can't I be there as well, right? And, and that's the, the motion with which we are moving across the board. And that's a critical part of how do you rebuild that culture back in my mind, right? And I think that's why I, I wanted to show this slide from a Wipro perspective. At the same time, I also want to call out that while, while the employee experience and simplification and velocity is all critical, what we also did is that globally, we actually have regional councils that have been created. Uh, Wipro in the US have 10 regional councils that we have created now with a leader that's, uh, that's taking care of each of the reasons. And the reason for that is, just like during the pandemic, if the federal government came back and said, everybody stay at home, Texas and Florida said, I don't want to do it, screw you. And, and we did not want that same issue across uh, you know, the globe and across the US as well for us. So we created these regional councils for us so that we knew exactly what we wanted in each regional office and the, and the employee base there and with our clients together. And what do we do to be able to build that in-office culture back again? Some of these initiatives that you see there, right from the, the table tennis tournaments that we've been running every, every week, and you won't believe it, for people who did not want to come to office, they stay back till 9, 9.30 in the night to play now. For the Wipro Cares that we do, we had close to about you know, 40 students come in from a local school here. Interestingly, the next school that came in was about 35 students from UK who flew all the way to the Bay Area to actually be a part of our innovation center. So things like these, are bringing others in, but it is also bringing our employees in to be able to be there, contribute, and you know share their knowledge with uh, with, with customers, partners, and uh, you know employees that we're sorry uh, uh, students that we that are coming in. And last but not the least, uh, to me, bonding time is not about just party, but it's also about how do you you know care and and contribute to the society. So at least in the Bay Area, what we've done is we've uh, partnered with One Tree and we actually do events like the, the tree planting that we did in San Jose uh, back in the spring. And, and these are all part and parcel of you know, how I look at it as re-emphasizing and, and uh, recast or recharge the, uh, the culture off in office and why that becomes an important and integral part and parcel of, of life for us. I want to take a second example. This is actually a large tech company uh, in the Bay Area. Uh, and they were struggling with the similar topic of, you know, as, as employees are working remote, how do I bring all of them back in? Uh, what they did during the pandemic was, they actually opened an office in Austin as well, and they have expanded onto the Austin side. Now, being Austin, they actually got more footfall in the Austin office as compared to the Bay Area, but nevertheless, they, they, they did have a challenge. So what we did with them was an interesting approach. We actually said, I'm going to create a superior in office experience for employees. I'm going to bring in the right collaboration tools, partnerships, and the processes that are required for, for me to be able to enable that in the right way. But at the same time, I, they did not want to do it just because somebody felt, you know, these were the things that were going to help them, right? So we actually went together with them, did a baseline of what it meant to be an in-office uh, worker, what it meant to be a remote worker, what it meant to be a hybrid uh, workplace for some of those teams. We use that to say, let's design an aspirational experience for each one of them. And that became the fulcrum of where do we really want to get to as a North Star? And how do we create the roadmap of steps that will enable us to get there? Last but not the least, we also did a purposeful compare as a benchmark to other organizations who have worked both in an office, in a hybrid or in a completely remote model. And I will be honest that some of the, the CEOs who have been very vocal about a 100% remote, they themselves had an inherent reason for why they wanted to do it remote, either because of the cost of real estate or because of lack of availability of a common place from where they were hiring talent. And last but not the least, you know, personal constraints because of which people are spread out across the, the different regions. And how do I really adapt to that? So we wanted to use those as more of a benchmark for us to understand what did they do to be able to enable that work model to, to be productive and how do we 
learn from that and, and make it a, an integral part of the, the, the model here, but all with the outcome of driving productivity. So I'm happy to say that in the last six months, what we've done for them is one brought back almost 50% of their workforce into the office for three days a week. Uh, they still give them flexibility in terms of how to operate in a, in a hybrid model. But the benchmark that we did, the baselining that we did, the tools and the productivity and the, sorry, the tools and the processes and the tech that we have put in place for them is really what is helping them adapt and, and continue to keep the productivity, uh, you know, higher than what they were uh, before they started this exercise. Last but not the least, this is a model change and hence I wanted to talk through this a little bit. I think every one of us in the, in the firms that we've operated, we've probably had some auditor uh, or some you know, tax firm that's been working with us. Uh, this was a consulting firm that primarily used to do tax and audit for our customers, uh, which essentially meant that the tax auditors were literally flying in Monday through Thursday every week at, into one customer or the other. And, and that's how they really did their job in the, in the uh, pre-pandemic days. During the pandemic, they were completely remote. Uh, which essentially meant that you know they had to do and adapt everything that they did previously in a remote fashion and now as they were looking to come back into the office the fundamental question that got asked was if you could do all of this remotely why do you really need to be in front of the client anymore uh, that that saves dollars from an organization perspective it saves dollars for the client who's paying for it third it is also sustainable from an environment perspective so there was a big question that got asked top down to say, do you really need to do this? And we said fundamentally that there are two nuances to it. There are certain regulatory compliance and other needs for which there does need to be a physical presence in certain audit uh, functions that they're playing. So we said that cannot be done away with. So we have to get that done. The second was, we said if we could do it all of this remotely during the pandemic, what we ended up doing was we said the same platforms that were built for their consultants to be able to do the work we now retrofitted them. We actually created a, a cloud-based model for them to be able to extend these to their partners, to their customers in that sense. So the customer could now do a self-audit by themselves using the same platform and the same set of uh, you know, uh, framework that the, that the consulting firm used, which actually meant that they could expand their market. Earlier, they were only interested and they, they could only service a particular set of clients in the global 2000 uh, market, but now, or sorry, the Fortune 2000 market, now with this platform, they were able to extend it to a much larger customer base. That meant they could go behind a much larger uh, market from, a, from an audit perspective. That triggered them to say, let me work through this to see how am I able to create a hybrid model for me to be able to drive the same book of work, but now I'm going to be able to do this with multiple types of customers, not necessarily following the, the model, the business model that I had prior to the pandemic, if you may. So in that context, I thought this was a critical one for you to at least get a feel of how organizations are looking at this, not just from a perspective of back to office or in office culture, but it is also a means for them to use it as a pivot to say, how am I going to look at this from a future of work perspective and maybe even the business model that, that I can adapt to, that will really help me uh, succeed in the market, right? So that pretty much is what I wanted to cover here today. Hopefully I, I finished within 40 minutes so we can go for lunch. Any questions? Thank you. No questions? Awesome. Yep. Mm -hmm. No, so we, so we, right, right. So th that survey was already done. It was done with the, with the assumption that anything that is one, one day and more is part of uh, hybrid or, or remote work. Uh, so we did not call out remote as 100% remote. Uh, we just said anything one, one day and above is, is uh, remote. So, uh, if, if I were to call out the financial services one, I think uh, during the pandemic, uh, they didn't have a choice. They did what they had to do. Uh, clearly, there is a drop in productivity on uh, the return of investment 
of an investment manager who's working remote now versus in office, uh, partly because they're not trained. They're not getting the, the right level of guidance and coaching from their team leaders as compared to what it was at the start of the pandemic when uh, you know they, uh, most of them were already existing employees. So I think if for nothing else, but the fact that that training, enablement, coaching, guiding, and that framework is actually impacting productivity for them. So they're forcing people to come back. So you would see that across, uh, you know, whether it's Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, Chase, et cetera, they're all pushing their employees to get back at least for three to five days, uh, sorry, anywhere between three to five days. I don't think that's a, a, you know, a choice anymore for people who want to do that kind of a role. Of course, anything on the, on the teller side or in the branch side was always in person uh, in that sense. The tech job, I would continue to say, is probably the, the highest remote even now. So if, you, if I take a, you know, a broad look across industry sectors for people who are in the, the IT side of our, our, our enterprise clients, most of those roles, they're not getting mandated to come back into office, right? That's probably one function where they're okay to still let people work remotely at this point in time, as long as it is not impacting the work output or the, uh, or the KPIs that they're signing up in business. But most of the others, I think the important as, aspect has been to look at it from a persona and from a role perspective rather than looking at it purely at a, you know, a broad base uh, brush across the arc. Raj, Alana's got a question right here and I'll bring the microphone over sure. here. Really quickly, I love how you spoke about community mm -hmm. um, because I think it's really important to concentrate on those clustered areas where people relocated and mm -hmm. you may not add real estate or may not right. need to. So I think there's a lot of creative ways that we can still build a community and and, and anchor people to feel like they are part of Zoom mm -hmm. and a brand. They need that brand. They want to feel like part of a community. And you right. can do so much outreach in those clustered areas. Right. But it's going to take some a program, right? Somebody right. to run the program for it to be right. consistent and have that value. So I love that. I think right. it's really important right. to target it's, that it's 80%. Ab absolutely important because at least... Uh, uh, and I, you know, I, while I'm seeing this across the board, the one example that I can give is... Uh, for, for some of the consulting firms like ours, where we have large setups concentrated in a, in a single city location, we're actually looking at expanding into smaller satellite cities purely based on heat map. And the way we are doing this is not based on what is the declared location of the individual on uh, GAL, but it is really being done based on the IP address and the mapping and how we are finding out. So technologies like Joint Digital becomes a critical part and parcel of, you know, how do you figure that heat map out and then plan for it. It's again irony that you know pre-pandemic we used to work with Cisco uh, on a on a solution called Connected Spaces. At that time, this was needed purely because people didn't have space to work inside offices. Right, offices were full, so we were trying to use that more as a means to say, you know, why are two people using a ten-people room? Right? Why why are there so many blocked spaces when you know there are people who can't find hoteling locations when they go to other offices? Right. So we used it for a different reason. Now we're just pivoting that to say. How do we use the same tools, but in a different contextual way to be able to improve the, uh, the community? Question in the back corner. All right. So yep. uh, following on to Stephen's question about where the differences are among industries, I think mm -hmm. there's another differentiation. So if you think about companies, they have life cycles. Like there's ascendancy, there's plateau, there's decline. Mm -hmm. Are you seeing different uh, methodologies, participation, based upon where a company is in its life cycle. So early on, it's it's all mission driven. We're trying to change the world and you get really good buy-in. At the other end of the cycle, it's, I just I just gotta keep my head down, right? <laughs> I, I, I don't wanna be, I don't wanna be found <laughs> out. So is, is there differences in, in how people approach the, the return to work and I, management? I think uh, that starts with the leadership for the, for the organization, right? Uh, I think in many cases, if the leader creates that that empathy, the trust, and the empowerment, uh, and as long as directionally, you know, they're able to give that kind of a freedom for the employees to work together and, and collaborate and, and be successful, then honestly, it doesn't matter whether it is at the start or in a, in a more steady state model. I think part of this comes back down to how are you empowering, enabling them, but at the same time being able to, you know, track and measure the progress that they're able to make because that should be the criteria for, you know, how do you really swing the uh, the balance in terms of how much do you need in person versus how much can you get done remotely from there. Lunch. I'm hungry. 
So, <laughs> great. Thank you, Raj. Thank you.